Well, we're in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 17. And uh, so far as we've gotten up to chapter 17, man, this whole world's a mess, isn't it? I mean, all the stuff that's been going through with the vials and the trumpets and the uh, and the uh, seals and all that stuff, and and then from the aspect of what the Antichrist is up to, this world's a mess. This world's a mess. And so let's pick up in verse 3. We're going to look at verses 3 through 7. It says, So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was, written, uh, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the day once again. But God, we need your blessing on the message today, Lord, that you'd, just, you'd be the teacher and that you'd uh, open our eyes and our hearts to see things that maybe we we never really considered or maybe we've already considered and know and you uh, re-emphasize them in our lives and God uh, we, we just want to learn more about you and what's going on in the days to come and we pray it in Jesus name amen so there's some dots we need to connect here last week we talked a lot about this chapter uh, we did a, a whole introduction before we even look at verses 1 and 2 and we pointed out how this thing is definitely the Catholic Church. The woman is the Catholic Church. And we went through all kinds of historical facts to, to document that. And you know, there's probably still some folks that say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to buy into that. And that's okay. I can't, you know, it's, it's, I was having a good conversation with my son this week. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but in that conversation, I told him, I said, you know, I can't convict anybody of anything. God may show me something that he hasn't shown somebody else and I may know the truth and I may tell somebody that truth but when it comes down to convicting them to change their behavior I have no power to do that none all I can do is tell them the truth and 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 over the course of time I believe this from the bottom of my heart I believe there's Christians that don't grow because they refuse to accept what God's given them God gives them truth. A good preacher once said, light rejected becomes lightning. I believe that. I believe that. God gives people light, and he may give it to them time and time again, and they may rebel. They may say, I'm just not going to believe that or whatever. And that can stymie their spiritual growth. Think about Jesus talking to the apostles when he said, I have many things to tell you, but you're, you can't bear them at this time. You're, you're not ready for them. I've given you a lot of truth. You're struggling with it. I mean, the Bible goes through accounts of the apostles struggling with the things that Jesus told them. And Jesus' position is, well, if you can't accept that, you're not ready for the next truth because that's foundational to the next truth. And so... Uh, we may put on a stiff neck and a hard head. God's people are notorious for that. They've done it since the beginning of time. Israel, God calls them stiff-necked all the time. And if you think the Christians are doing a better job with spiritual truth than Israel was, you're kidding yourselves. We're stiff-necked. We're bold-headed. We want to believe what we want to believe. And don't confuse me with the facts. This woman... Uh, if you just look at history and the description of the woman, there's only one organization on the face of the earth that fits the bill. Only one. And so we're going to connect some dots here with this adulterous, whorish, religious prostitute who showed up earlier in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Let's, why don't you just keep your finger here because we're, we're not going to be staying in Revelation 12, but we looked at this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. 
about verse 3, is a free man? 3 is perfection, actually. <laughs> And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, when we went through that, this is who the woman's riding on, this great beast. And we're going to look at that here in a minute. We're going to compare the two portions of Scripture. And uh, keep your, don't lose your place here in 12, because we are going to go back and forth a little bit, but we're not going to do it a lot, but we're going to go back and forth a little bit. So let's do some comparisons about this great beast. In Revelation 12, 3, it's a red dragon. In Revelation 17, verse 3, and you can look back and forth between the two if you want. Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 17, a scarlet, what color is scarlet? It's bright red. A scarlet colored beast. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, the dragon has seven heads. In Revelation chapter 17, verses 3 through 7, the beast that carried the woman has seven heads. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, the, the seven heads of the dragon has ten horns. And if you go over here to Revelation chapter 17, the beast that carried the harlot has ten horns. The ten horns per head? Or ten, horns? ten horns total. Total across the seven heads. Yeah, and when we went through Revelation chapter 12, we explained why there's seven heads and yet there's ten horns. Uh, we went through all that thing, but the, you know, one of those folks was and the Bible says this was and is not and will be Judas Iscariot he was he is not now but he's coming back in the tribulation and he will be and so uh, there's a lot of false teaching about who this beast is although it's very clear who the beast is of Revelation 17 and the of Revelation 12 is very to me you can let go of Revelation 12 now because we're not going to be going back and forth anymore but to me the, the it's not even debatable it's pretty clear who that it's the same beast right but there's a lot of false teachings about this there was a great Christian evangelist named Billy James Hargis he was born August 3rd 1925 and he died November 27th 2004 and he taught that this beast was communism. The beast that the woman rode on was communism. Um, Billy Graham actually taught the same thing, and it probably has a lot to do with the era in which they came up through. Communism was the great evil, and, and uh, you know, you had the McCarthy trials and stuff going on, and communism. But you know what? They were the Reds. They were the Reds, amen. And so there's, there's some things where they pull out of the Bible and they change what it says to line up with what they want to teach and believe. And uh, it, was a popular, uh, the, it was a popular teaching and it comes from being too caught up in the world if you ask me. We get caught up in the world and we think that we have um, we think we have the answers of everything because of the world. We got to be, I'm not saying that you can't get answers from the world but you got to be careful with that thing. You got to be careful with it. America went through this great scare of communism, which is still alive and well today. I mean, half this stuff about the impeachment of Trump has to do with him buddying up with the Russians and hurting the Ukraine and helping the Russians, etc., etc. And uh, I'm going to have you brace yourself for this theological truth I'm about ready to give you. And you can reject this truth, but it's truth nonetheless. God is not an American. God's not an American. And uh, God does not even endorse or support democracy. When he comes and sets up the perfect government in this world, it's not going to be a democracy. It's going to be a theocracy. And the closest thing we've had on earth to a theocracy is a monarchy. Well, our founding fathers, rightfully so, didn't want a monarchy because the only way you can have a righteous monarch... <laughs> is if that monarch is God. And that's been proven over history because men get corrupted by power. And that's the Democrats' whole thing about Trump is that, that, uh, um, that he thinks of himself as a king and that he abuses his power. And so uh, God's not a Democrat and he's not a Republican. He's God. And God's a king. Bible calls him 
Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Amen. He's a king, and when he returns, he's going to stand. He's not going to establish a monarchy such as the world is seen. Like I said, it's going to be a theocracy. He's going to be a king, but it's going to be a theocracy, not a monarchy. It's going to be spiritually based, and it's going to be 100% righteous. You know, people, you start looking at the Bible, and people, people don't want to believe it because it touches on things that in the times weren't politically. We don't see things the way God sees things. We don't think of things the way God thinks of things. His ways aren't our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. If we want to know who the red dragon is and the same entity that carries the woman, we must resort to the Bible to find out who that is. And if you go back to, I said you were done with Revelation 12, but I want you to look at one other thing. Amen. We're bondmen. We're bought with the price. Amen. And you were a bondman before Christ redeemed you because you were the slave to sin. So no matter what you do, you're a slave. So look at verse 9 in Revelation chapter 12. That great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this red dragon, and I think Lisa was digging through her seeing if there's anything in Revelation 12 that talks about crowns and uh, I don't I think she came up empty but you know what the devil is called a beast and and uh, I don't think you can discount the exact description just because in the the only difference in the description are the crowns and I don't think you can discount that I don't think that you can throw that theological truth out just because one had crowns and the other one didn't can a crown be removed? So the 13-1? Yeah, seven horns and ten, yeah, seven heads and ten horns, same beast, yep. Yep, same thing. It's a devil. And the devil's bringing in his Trinity, the false prophet and uh, the, uh, the, the devils of the father and the false prophet and, and the, um, why am I drawing a blank, Lisa? Help me out. What's that? The Antichrist. Thank you. So uh, this is Satan. And he's, the Bible, the book of Revelation said in another place that he's given that woman his seed. And so she comes in riding on him. And uh, I don't think that it can be clearer than what it is. I, I don't. I, and brother, I'm not trying to say I'm, you can believe whatever you want to believe. And if you want to say that's not the same critter, it's, that's fine. But, but I think that the Bible's crystal clear on it myself. And comparing scripture with scripture. There's no place where you have a description so close. There, there's a one point in Revelation chapter... Oh man, I'm gonna, I'll be shooting at it, but I think it's like chapter 5 where it talks about the person coming in with the bow and a lot of people treat, teach that that's Jesus Christ and it's the Antichrist coming in. Jesus Christ doesn't come with the bow, he comes with the sword. And uh, But the descriptions are so different that in order for you to believe that that's Christ and not the Antichrist, you have to throw out a whole lot of stuff that makes it different. So, and if we look at what we looked at last week, this woman that's riding on the devil is the Roman Catholic Church. And, and uh, that's hard to swallow. And we talked about, John said he looked at her with uh, um, great... Admiration. And we went through different definitions of admiration last week. Admiration doesn't necessarily mean that you adore it. It can mean that you are um, totally shocked at the wickedness of it. And that's the context of the admiration that John's looking at this woman with because he was expecting um, pagan Rome. Pagan Rome was who was attacking the Christians in the lifetime of John 
and when he saw, he wouldn't be shocked by it if it was pagan Rome that was still going after him, but it was a religious institution in papal Rome that he saw, and he, he was shocked by it. These folks named Christ. These folks use the name of Jesus Christ, and he was shocked by it. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. As a matter of fact, there's, uh, there's books out that talk about a black pope, that, that the pope that the public sees isn't the real figure behind the Roman Catholic Church. But you know what? Here's the problem. And we're going to talk about this in much greater detail, but, but here's the problem. You got uh, masonry, and some folks think masonry is a good thing. And Albert Pike, who was probably one of the greatest American masons that ever lived in history, he's thought of and quoted. He's written several books, and a direct quote from Albert Pike was. Folks that don't understand that masonry is a luciferian organization are blind. But you know, you go to the average mason and tell them that's a satanic club you belong to. They're going to think you're crazy. And uh, most of them were. Matter of fact, the vast majority of them were. Not every one of them. There's some that they don't know for sure. There's none that they can absolutely prove were not but there's a couple of them that they can't absolutely prove that they were. But George Washington was a famous Mason, and, and, uh, but Mace, Masonry is a satanic organization. But their general rank and file don't know it. The general rank and file think there's only 32 degrees in Masonry. But the folks that are way high up in it know there's more than 32 degrees. <laughs> and so you can go all the way to a 32 degree Mason and say, no, that's not what our organiza organization's about. But you have folks like Sir Francis Bacon that were part of it, and they, he was instrumental in the founding of America. Yeah. I'm telling you, evil was present. When the Bible says, when I do good, evil is present. When America was being founded, it wasn't just all angels and glory hallelujah. Evil was present. And so <clears throat> the same holds true with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is a satanic organization. There's no doubt about it. But the that doesn't mean that Roman Catholics rank and file the general population are satanic. They think they're worshiping God. They think that they're doing right. They're duped. That's why I say things like the only thing worse than no hope is a false hope. Because you think you're okay because you went and told the priest everything you did bad this week and he says do three Hail Marys to our fathers and six acts of contrition and you're forgiven. Well, that's not the forgiveness of God. God does, God's forgiveness doesn't include any acts of contrition or any Hail Marys or any Our Fathers. No works involved in it. So, something occurred to me because this stuff about the Roman Catholic Church isn't being talked about. It's still being talked about, but not as much as it was 50 years ago. And so it occurred to me, some folks may think, well, this is just the rantings of our out-to-lunch pastor that he's, he's on his own on this one. So I went into the Internet, and uh, what search engine do we use on that thing? Do you know? It must be Google. So at any rate, I went into the Internet, and, and for my search engine, I typed in, historic preachers that taught that Revelation 17 was referenced to the Roman Catholic Church. I got 13,300,000 articles <laughs> talking about Revelation chapter 3 being connected with her. Now, I didn't go through all 13,300,000 articles because that would have taken me far too long, and I'm sure that there's some in there that are written by Catholics that are defending that it's not. But this isn't a silent subject that is uh, the ramblings of an obscure pastor in a time. I, I wish I was born 150, 200 years ago because I'd have been probably a lot bit more, more well received than I am today. But truth doesn't change. Truth doesn't change. And uh, so <clears throat> the great reformers taught this. 
The great preachers of the church of Philadelphia taught this. So we must make some clear distinctions though about Roman Catholics and we're, we're going to talk, I said we're going to talk about that in more detail. But I did print off one of the articles that talks about uh, Roman Catholicism and uh, the connection with Revelation chapter 17. It was a well, fairly well written article. And uh, Did the Catholic Bible change from 17? What's that? Does the Catholic Bible change? Oh, I'm sure it does. Well, but the Catholic Church itself will admit that uh, Revelation chapter 17 is talking about Rome. They'll admit that. But they'll say it's pagan Rome and not, not papal Rome. But it's papal Rome, not pagan Rome. Like I said, if it would have been pagan Rome, John wouldn't have been shocked at all. He'd say, so they're going to still be at it clear at the end. Because that's who was doing the persecution at the time, was pagan Rome. Did Calvin think the Pope was the Antichrist? Yes. And so did... Uh, Tyndale, and so did, and so did Martin Luther, and so did all the reformers. Came to the conclusion that the Roman Catholic Church was the method whereby the Antichrist would infiltrate the world. And um, you'll see in that article where it talks about the ecumenical movement that's being headed by the Pope. He's bringing together this these this league of churches that includes Hindus. Muslims, American Indians, and every, he lets witch doctors open the meetings in prayer. You gotta be careful about what you're willing to join yourself to, folks. In America, they have this great thing called the National Day of Prayer. God takes no pleasure in that. Half those people aren't even praying to him. You've got one person kneeling down saying, Lord, help the homosexual movement gain momentum, and another person praying, Lord, stop the home. The prayer, unified prayer is not, prayer is, in, prayer is meaningless unless it's unified. You can't have a national day of prayer where everybody's praying for different things that don't line up and think, well, this is a good godly thing that we're doing here. We first started this church, and I think it was the first month that we were in business, we got invited to go to another church to join them in fellowship for a special event that they had going. And there were some people here that wanted to go to that event. And that was going to be on a Wednesday night. And I said, I, I, I didn't say anything till I was done preaching the message that Wednesday night. And at the end of the message, I said, listen, you all, you all were here when this guy came in, invited us to their church this coming Wednesday night and if y'all want to go it's a free world you can go but I'm going to be right here in our church preaching well we almost lost one family over that we ended up not losing them but somebody stood up and said that's it I've had it and slamming things around and stomped out of here and we thought we'd lost that family turned out we didn't lose that family but you want to know what you don't build and start a church and build a church by going to somebody else's church. And the other thing that I tried to explain at that time, that church doesn't believe the things that we profess to believe in this church. You don't join in fellowship with another denomination or another. Listen, the God, Jesus wanted unity and fellowship with believers, but he wanted that unity and fellowship in truth. If you talk to anybody that's ecumenical that wants churches to get together, they'll say, let's lay aside our doctrine so that we... But doctrine is everything that you stand for. To Maurice's point, what is the purpose of this church? It's the doctrine that it teaches. And if there's another church that has different doctrines, we can't go join with them and fellowship. You can... Listen, I'm not saying that they're not Christian. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But we can't join with them as an institution. We can still have friends from that church. We can still uh, socialize with people from that church. But the two churches can't join together because there's doctrinal differences. And I hope you all can see that. And, and uh, I'm never going to say don't go. Don't because you, it's a free world. You can do whatever you want to do. So, let's make some clear distinctions about our approach to Catholics, though. Because some folks think when I talk about Mormonism or Catholicism or 
Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, that I hate those people and I don't. Most Catholic members are good people. Most of them, not all of them. But most of them are good people. Matter of fact, some of the most moral people that I know on this face of this earth are either Roman Catholic or Mormon. They're moral people. They're good people. They're friendly people. They're nice people. And uh, some are more moral than we are or that I am. I'll just put it on my shoulders. I won't put it on your shoulders. They don't understand that their church is evil. They don't know that. They don't even know what they stand for because their church doesn't teach the Bible. So they can't know that they're evil because they don't teach the Bible. And uh, they believe that they're Christians because their church does name Christ. But there must be some significant issues pointed out. They actually place Mary above the Lord Jesus Christ in the Roman Catholic Church. And that would not be the Mary of the Bible. It's the Mary that they've made up in their own religion. Because the Mary of the Bible, the last words that Mary in the Bible says, it's at a wedding. And she says, whatever he says, do it. That's the last recorded words of Mary. Whatever he says, do it. And uh, the Mary that they worship is the woman in Revelation chapter 17. It's not Jesus' mom. It's, it's the queen of heaven. And when they speak of the Immaculate Conception, how many of you have heard of the Immaculate Con Conception? What is it? Somebody tell me what the Immaculate Conception is. You don't know? So the Immaculate Conception is Mary's conception of Jesus Christ. That is... But that's not what Catholicism teaches. The Immaculate Conception is the conception of Mary in the Catholic doctrine. She's blessed above women. And the Immaculate Conception is the conception of Mary. And she's the blessed one that brings the Lord into the world. And they worship her. And they pray to her. Yes, which is the woman of Revelation chapter 17. Mary on a half shell, that's what I call it. You know what I'm talking about? It's Mary in, Mary in a bathtub. Mary in a bathtub, I call it Mary on a half, half shell. Um, that's Revelation chapter 17. Amen, amen. The Mary that they have, they call her the queen of heaven, which sounds good. She's the queen of heaven. But once again, they're not well versed in the Bible. Do you know that the Catholic, uh, in the Council of Trent, uh, forbids their members to read the Bible? Because when people start reading the Bible, they start leaving the Catholic Church because it doesn't line up. That's what happened with Martin Luther. That's what happened with Tyndale. That's what happened just going down the line. All the reformers left the Catholic Church because they started reading their Bible. Why do you think the Catholic Church was so adamant that they didn't want the Bible printed in the common man's language? They wanted to keep it in Latin because the average person didn't know Latin and that now we have a monopoly on it. Whatever we say goes. And so, uh, Queen of Heaven sounds good, but turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 7. No. Well, they're connected, but they're not the same thing. No, 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 not the same thing, but I mean, heaven, air. So, turn to Jeremiah chapter 7 and look at verse 18. It says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods. <laughs> it's idolatry. God has nothing to do with that. That they may provoke me to anger. That's God talking. He doesn't like the Queen of Heaven. Queen of Heaven's Revelation chapter 17. It's the Mary of the Roman Catholic Church. Look at uh, Jeremiah 
chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. And uh, verse 17. It says, But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. In other words, they're not going to do things God way. They're going to do things their way. Out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done. We and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Ju Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things. We have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and to pour out drink offerings unto her without our man? Queen of heaven's not a good thing. The Roman Catholic Church rightly calls their Mary the queen of heaven because that's who she is. Drop down to verse uh, 25. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouth and filled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. God says, You want the queen of heaven? You can have her. I'm done with you. My name's not going to be among you anymore. Queen of heaven's not a good thing. They call Mary the mother of God. <laughs> Mary's not the mother of God. Because before Abraham was, Jesus was. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus or Mary did not, she's not the mother of God. She was the vessel whereby God came to earth in the form of man. And really other than that, there's nothing special about her. She was a sinner that needed to accept Jesus Christ as her Savior or perish and go to hell. Now I'm confident she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior because she knew who he was. She knew she was a virgin. She knew, I mean, if there's anybody that knew the truth of the virgin birth, it was Mary. And she knew that her son was God. They don't believe the Bible and they place their traditions above the Holy Bible. Now, I told you once before about my um, debate with the, with the Roman Catholic Diocese where I was quoting Bible and eventually in frustration he said, listen, you know your Bible way better than I do. I'm not going to argue that. But in our church, our traditions have more weight than the Bible. He said that. A diocese. Our traditions have more weight than the Bible. Well, okay, that's interesting. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 6. Uh, we need to get the contents. Let's go to verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? That's Jesus talking to the Pharisees. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by, and honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. God said, Take care of your mom and dad. The priests, the Jewish priests said, 
listen, we need the money more than your mom and dad do. Just give us the money and say it's a gift and you'll be free from any condemnation that comes from not taking care of your mom and dad. And Jesus said, that ain't right. Your tradition has made the word of God an effect. We're supposed to take care of our mom and dad. Look at Mark chapter 7. I think it's a recount of the uh, same situation. Verse, uh, yeah, it is a recount of the same thing. So I'm not going to read the whole contents, but look at verse uh, 13. Mark chapter 7, verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things. You do. There's a reason why I don't like traditions. Now, not all, all traditions are bad. And you say, well, how do you pick and choose what traditions? The Bible says don't depart from the traditions that you've learned from the apostles. <laughs> so how do you know which traditions that are good and which ones aren't bad? If the tradition is outlined in the Bible saying do this, it's good. If the tradition comes from man saying don't worry about the Bible, do this, it's not good. And I have not seen a religion that doesn't have traditions that are put on by man and not by the Bible. And so when I... When, when I see them, and I've seen me preaching them sometimes, and I go, oh, well, wait a second. That's not what it says. And I try and correct it because when we alter the Bible, we make it of none effect. And uh, we ought not to do that. Their church teaches that anybody who believes you are saved by grace alone is cursed and damned to hell. That's what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Uh, it was brought up in the Council of Trent. Let anybody who says that they are saved by grace be anathema. Anathema means damned to hell. And, and absolutely, they lose their power over the people because they're a Nicolaitan outfit, which thing God hates. And so uh, you got Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, that is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if a Catholic starts reading the Bible and they come across Ephesians 2, 8, 9, they go, well, wait a second. What am I going and talking to that guy in the phone booth about? Because he can't forgive my sins. And you know, that was the key thing that, that started getting Martin Luther to turn away from the Catholic Church because he would say in his, when he was sent to the, because he was a, a Roman Catholic monk, and he'd go to the confessional to hear other people's confessions and he'd say, how can I forgive them of anything? I'm just as bad as they are. The reason Jesus can forgive you is because he wasn't as bad as you are. And when you get saved, all his righteousness gets put on you and all your sin gets put on him. And that's the cup that he didn't want to drink of, that sin, that ugly, nasty sin. He didn't want to put on him. The church through their teaching of communion calls Jesus down from heaven afresh every week, sacrificing him afresh for the sins of, the, of their people have committed throughout the week. They believe that when they take the wine and the Eucharist, is what they call it, and they turn and they hold it up there and they do their little chant, they're calling God down to sacrifice afresh for your sins. That's what they teach. And that's what their little offshoot harlots teach as well but if you look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 it addresses that very issue because that was already taking place back when Hebrews was written let's look at uh, to get a little context let's go up to verse 9 it says then said he lo I chapter uh, 10 verse 9 it says uh, then he said lo I come to do thy will O God that's Jesus he taketh away the first that he may establish a second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all he can't come down and be sacrificed afresh he was sacrificed once for all and, uh, and every priest standeth daily. This is, this is a description of the Catholic priest. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice 
sacrifices which can never take away sins. And they teach you that the communion is what gets you good with God. And that's why excommunication carries a lot of weight. Because if I take away your ability to have our communion, you're damned to hell. You get your salvation through me offering Christ afresh for you. But the average Catholic, they don't get it because they don't read their Bible because they're told not to read their Bible. It takes away all of Christ's power. Amen. So they teach that they're the one and only true church. Any church that teaches that, run from it. There's no such thing as one true, unless you're talking about just the universal of Christianity in itself, that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ and we make up the church. But you'll never hear me say this is the only right church. You're not going to hear me say that. I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a minute. I believe there's people that are totally blessed and growing in the Lord over at Living Water. Now, I don't ag agree with everything they teach at Living Water, and I'm not going to join hands with them, but there's born-again Christians that are growing in the Lord at Living Water. There's born-again Christians that are growing in the Lord at the feed store. And there's other ones, too. I'm not going to say we're the only church. But what is it that Marie said when we started this thing? People, I know what we stand for. And you know how you can tell what we stand for? It's in our name. Bible Believers Community Church. Which implies we believe the Bible, whether it's convenient, whether it's inconvenient. And we're going to dig into the Bible, and we're going to study the Bible, and we're going to know the Bible so that we can't be duped by stuff like this. These folks think they're Christians. I believe Mormons think they're Christians. They're not. If they believe the doctrines of their church, they're not Christians. And we need to tell them that they're not Christians. Their church teaches that they are to pray to the saints in order to be heard by God and they consistently pray to Mary and their teaching is that because Mary's the mother of God she's going to have some kind of special influence with Jesus Christ so Jesus might tell you no but certainly he wouldn't tell his mom no so pray to her so that she can be the intercessor for you to God well there's a couple problems with that first of all and, and we're going to, I'm not done with this yet but we're out of time so I'm going to stop there and we're going we're gonna to continue on with the average Catholic next week, but turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and um, verse 5. Now I'm in 2 Timothy. I'm sitting there reading that going, that isn't what I wanted when I'm in 2 Timothy. If I go to the right verse, then usually it is what I want. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now the Catholic Church would say that for there is one God and one mediator between man and God, the mother of God, Mary. Pray to her. She's the mediator for you. No, you don't pray to her. Um, you might want to write this down so you can go look at it. I'm not going to turn you there because we're going to wrap this up. But 1 Kings chapter 2 verses 13 through 24. And I'm just going to tell you the story real quick. What you have is you have um, Solomon has just been made king of Israel. Now his older brother by another wife had been running around town getting a big train behind him and folks were saying God saved king so and so. And uh, he was going to make himself king, but David hadn't died yet. And Bathsheba, who was Solomon's mom, went into David and said, "Didn't you swear to me that David or Solomon would take your place in the kingdom? And yet, so and so's down here. I don't know why I can't remember his name, but I can. So and -so, Adonijah, I don't, know, is down here making this big fuss, and uh, he's making himself king, and he's invited the priests and everything. And David calls." the folks together and he says Solomon's going to be king and he anoints him king right then and there and Solomon becomes king. Well then his brother went to Bathsheba 
This is a picture, folks. Solomon's wife. And he even went to her saying, would you ask a petition of Solomon for me? Because surely you're his mom and he wouldn't say no to his mom. <laughs> and so she said, yeah, I'll go to him. And so she went and she asked what she asked of him. And Solomon said, certainly my brother has spoke this to his own demise. He's going to die because of this. You don't get grace by going to the king's mom. <laughs> There's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And with that, we're going to close in a word of prayer and we'll pick up. There's more stuff that we want to talk. Listen, I don't want you having the wrong attitude about Catholics. They're good people. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to hear the truth. They need to be witnessed to. Same with Mormons. Same with Jehovah's Witnesses. They're lost just like you were lost before you got saved. And they need a Savior. And we need to love them. I totally remember part of it. And I can't even say where it is that when the things called Jesus and his mother and his brothers were outside of place. Yeah. And he said, Who is my mother and my brothers? Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't like, Oh, my mother, have her come in. Yeah, amen. Amen. And uh when she asked him to go make wine at the feast, he said, what have I to do with thee? Don't you know I need to be about my father's business? Not Joseph's business. 